Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Punch, Kick, Choke, Chat. My name is Sean Benson. I am one of your hosts, and I'm so excited to start this conversation with Sensei Paul Bonner. Um, Sensei, I want to ask you something in terms of your training with, you know, law enforcement and just the general street type of thing that you help people understand. And my question is, talk about knives and why they're so dangerous. This is something we haven't talked about a ton in the show. You have talked about a lot or you we haven't? No. So we'd love to get into this because I think it's underrepresented as a weapon out there to be uh, good at or uh, leery of. Well, you just the danger for injury is such is so high, right? Regardless of whether the person is had a lot of training or not, as you guys know, if anyone that's, that's on this, if someone were to confront someone and attack them, you probably wouldn't know whether they had skill or not until things start, unless they're, you know what I mean? Like you wouldn't find out someone's a good grappler unless you saw their ears, all of a sudden you hit the ground and went, oh, this is different, right? Um, so with a blade, I mean, the chance for anyone doesn't require any strength. You don't need a lot of training. Anybody can purchase it um, to, to do damage to people. So it had, you know, it's very, very dangerous depending on dealing with a knife in reality. And what do you think is like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of getting specific here, but the public, whenever somebody with a knife um, meets a certain amount of force, what do you think is the misconception or is there a misconception you think the general public has about, oh, why don't you just disarm that person? Or, oh, why didn't you just, you know, is there is there a misconception among the public about what you can and can't do with someone with a knife easily? Um, if there is a misconception, I think it comes from uh, movies. Mm. They watch a lot of movies and they, they see things that people do that are all staged, you know, fights and so on and so forth. So they think that is the reality of it. Um, but that's not the reality of it, right? They're making a movie. It's a script. Uh, they practice everything they're going to do step by step. So um, I would think that is a, a big misconception. Right on. Um, Sensei Dofa, I know you're a fan of, of, of Blades, allegedly. What, what, what would you answer is, uh, you know, something people should be aware of or, or maybe a misconception they might have about them? I, get, I stand to be corrected. One thing about um, a lot of blades is you can't see them, right? Like you don't, you might think the person is empty handed, but they're not actually empty. Mm. And then you, you're willing to engage with them um, because you think it's going to be a mono a mono type of a situation and it's not. The next thing you know, you're, you're cut or you're being cut. Um, again, there's something that can easily be concealed. Most of the people walking around, if they right. have one, you know, whereas if, since the Sweeno's coming at me with a katana, I can see that I can see him coming from from a bit of a distance. Um, and I guess one thing that when people think they're tough, it's an equalizer in a way that it doesn't matter if you're tough and it doesn't matter if you're trained. Like once you get close, they're even a very untrained person is going to be able to do a lot of damage in a short amount of time with a with a bladed weapon. And I stand to be corrected by sense of honor because I, I'm not, these are just like my experiences and I'm not a professional with a blade other than I guess maybe a katana. Some mm. people would yeah, be professional with that. No, I agree totally. Doesn't require strength, easily concealed, easily disposed of. This um, way. Yeah. Um, Sensei Sweena, what, when you're thinking about blades, are, are you um, in any way versed with the, the, the shorter stuff or is, is that? outside your field well back in the day when i used to teach a lot of self-defense classes i spent a lot of time looking at closed circuit television recordings of attacks mm. and that was a real eye-opener first of all i don't recommend it to people and i've said this on this show before because if you do that right before you go to bed you're you have a lot of bad dreams <laughs> but um uh, I watched thousands of hours of closed circuit TV attacks, and I realized that what you see on in the movies, and even what you see in a lot of dojos, is way stylized. It's way um, uh, slowed down. It's way less chaotic, and a lot of times, the level of chaos and speed that happens in a knife attack is just beyond most people's ability to to appreciate. So, not that I'm an expert, I just watched a lot of it, and so that's what I tell people when I teach self defense: is be ready for maybe something you can't really even prepare for. Yeah. Um, Justin Sibonner? I was at a seminar once. Uh, the knife work that I've been 
that I've learned and been able to study under is through Guru Dan, Asa Dan Inasato and Guru Rick Fay. And I remember at a seminar, he was asked, uh, Mr. Anasano was asked, what would he do if he was confronted with a knight? And he said, do I get a firearm? They said, no. Um, can I get any other weapon in my hand? No. Um, when would you defend against a knight? He said, only when I had to. Anytime, if I can run and get the heck out of there, I'm just going to run and get out of there. I want nothing to do with it. And we're talking to someone who's obviously, well, depending how you want to look at it, I mean, he's the, he's the the gold standard for that training so part of the reason i was asking that question um is that i do know when i watch a lot of like vids online or whatever a lot of it looks like a knife attack that isn't terribly realistic like it looks like a single thrust and then people do all this stuff to disarm it is that is that good training or is that too inaccurate to how like what sensei dofan talked about like your average person's just gonna come in slashing but a lot of the defenses tend to have a very um, one sort of lunge attack. Well, it's it's kind of like it's kind of like in the in the stand up game. A person, if you're you're talking like kickbox and tie box and things, you're going to have to learn how to throw a strike before you're going to be able to defend against a strike, because then you right. know how it can be used against you. So if you train and understand knife training, then you you get a great respect for the damage that can be done with a knife and how it can be uh, utilized, which means you have great respect of how that knife might come to you. So you have a better understanding of the lines of attack and the fakes, like indirect attacks and so on, follow-up combination, things like that. I will say you know, you're correct on that, um, but you still have to start with line familiarization yeah. and notion. So you can't, you know, it's like taking, a, you know, one of the analogies I use is a, a parent and his son says, Daddy, I want to I want to play baseball. So he's out there in the backyard with his glove on. And his dad takes the ball, throws it up and bats it full speed at him. Says, go ahead, catch that one. Like, no, you roll it on the ground. You know how that right. works. So it's the same thing we do in martial arts uh, in different forms. And when it comes to knife, you got to learn how that might be used, what grip it might be in, what angle, what are the possibilities. And you get slowly integrated into those motions and how your body position could respond to that. The thing that I have learned about, one of the things I've learned about edge weapon is that, and you mentioned this, um, the people who train with a blade, the arm never locks out. It's like someone conducting an orchestra. It's mm -hmm. thrust, it's slash, it's going inside, outside, and so on and so forth. And then a smaller knife is harder to deal with than a larger knife because a larger knife can get caught up in clothing or you know controls and that, but small is just, it was very hard to get something out of somebody's hand like that. So I think that training that you're talking about comes from those early motions where you've got to give them something. Yep. But after that, it starts changing and speeding up. But like, like any training, you can only go to the level that someone else can respond and be able to sure. finish the session with confidence and not go, well, this will never <laughs> I'm in a lot of trouble. So yep. that's where, you know, like sparring, it's all the same, regardless of whether you're sparring, point fighting, or you're doing grappling, if you, you know, or if you're doing uh, stand up, like, you know, type boxing or things like that. It's, you've got to start out somewhere. Yeah. Right on. Love that. And we've talked a lot on different episodes about different pedagogies, and, and you can see us all nodding along with you. Um, Hanshi, just so you know, we're just chatting about the concept of, um, you know, knives and tactics in the street for maybe uh, smaller weapons and either misconceptions or ways that um, people might want to think about it. Is there anything you want to throw in on that? I'm not quite sure what you're asking me. Are you you're asking me how I would defend against it? Or? Yeah, or if you want to just throw out any thoughts about um, just that type of weapon in the street tactically. Yeah, well, personally, if I, I the way I would look at it now then would be if a guy has a knife, for instance, or that weapon, He's not going to kick or punch you, so you can concentrate all your effort on one movement. And I would go, I would, when the person came towards me, I would go to the elbow and push towards him as opposed to opening it up, if, if that's what you mean, right? So while it is more dangerous, you already know that he's going to move that one thing mm. and you can concentrate on that. I would 
keep myself at legs length away uh, so that he can't reach you or you can block it when he lunges in and then use your legs on his knees or his groin. That way you're further away from uh, this, the knife as opposed to trying to let him lunge in at your body. Just use your feet to keep it away. So, uh, I mean, when you're facing a knife, it's a tough job. You're gonna, you're gonna have, uh, you're gonna have to give something up in a way of possibly getting damaged to protect your life, right? So, that's about my take on it, I guess. Right on. Thanks, Hanchi. That's exactly the kind of thing we're just kind of chatting about to, to start our conversation. And, you know, I feel like this is a good time to jump into our intros. Um, everybody, welcome to Punch, Kick, Choke Chat. We're already into the conversation about tactics and street tactics and knives with Sensei Paul Bonner. My name's Sean Benson. I'm here with Sensei Randy Dauphin, Sensei Nicholas Suino, and Hanchi Gary Legacy. And uh, I don't have the exact number, um, but I have written down, and I talked about this last week, I underestimated 175 years of training between the four of us. I said much less than that last time, and that astonishes me. Um, and if you include multiple arts, I don't even know where we would go with that. So uh, I'm just honored and privileged to be among these uh, men as hosts of the show. Sensei Dofan, what do you want to tell everyone about our guest tonight? Yeah, I also want to say, though, that uh, I just want to apologize for the delay in uh, getting on. Um, Robert is... Uh, I don't think he's hosting anymore. I think he's disappeared now because he might be being a, a dad for the third time any second now. He might be. Yeah. So and we're excited for him. And I think he told me before he split that Daniel Holland is now hosting for us. So that is good. So he says he's here down in the bottom. So what I want to say about Sensei Bonner, um, he started training in London under uh, Park Yip, but that was a very short amount of time that he trained with him. Uh, then he joined with somebody that he knows very well. He joined with Harold Warden, um, and he trained with Harold Warden at Warden School of Self-Defense. Then he moved to Sarnia uh, in November of 1974 and signed up with uh, Ralph Chinnick. <laughs> Kempo Karate, that was the Tracy system of Kempo Karate, and he trained with him for four years, and he received his black belt from him. Um, he also trained under Sokia Terry Stanton from Kansas City in Shinkin Ryu Jiu-Jitsu, and he received his black belt from that art as well. Um, and I think it was 1978, Sensei Bonner, that you, uh, you took over that school full-time, um, and in 1985 until 1988, he trained with Wally Slokey, and that led him to becoming the European heavyweight um, kickboxing champion. He won that in France against the number 10 world-ranked uh, fighter. Uh, he <laughs> lost the decision for the Canadian title in 1988. He's also trained with uh, a very famous martial artist, Guru Dan Inasanto. You're actually not the first one to be on this show uh, who trains with him. Uh, we have another person who trained with Guru Anasanto. Um, in Thai boxing, Salat, Filipino Kali, uh, John Fon, Jet Kwando, Jet Kondu, and shoot wrestling. Uh, as well, uh, he trained under Guru Anasanto's highest ranking student, Rick Fay. Um, also comes up to this community, Kitchener, goes to Alliance Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu where he's a purple belt uh, and he trains there with Dragon uh, Konovic. He's very well known in this community. Um, one of the things I like to always say, um, I, I consider everybody on this call to be a real world martial artist in a world of martial artists where there's a lot of cosplay and people don't actually pressure test their things and and work in the right head space. But uh, Sensei Bonner doesn't suffer from that for sure. Um, you know, he, for decades, he's taught many uh, law enforcement and security students, um, hospital staff, just, and not about how to win with a kata or, <laughs> right, how to survive an attack. And uh, we were just talking about that in the knife fight and I'm really proud to have him on here. He was recommended to us by uh, Sensei Leo Laux. Um, and we're really happy to be talking to him. Can't wait to hear more about his history. Thanks, Thank Sensei. You. Thank you. 
You're welcome. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping for everybody. Um, if you're watching on our YouTube live stream, we're so happy you're here. Hit that subscribe and like button. If you're watching later, feel free to leave some comments and get excited about the conversation. If you're listening on those podcasts, same thing. But if you're listening live here on the Zoom, we've got the chat button at the bottom. And we're super excited to have you here as part of our living history. So that's where you can ask your questions in that bottom chat button on the Zoom screen for uh, Sensei Paul Bonner tonight uh, about any topics that might be exciting for you um, to hear about from him. And, and that makes you and all of us part of this community for, for our YouTube and our digital perpetuity. Um, and other than that, you know, we're, we're always super excited to steer you to our new website, the Punch Kick Choke Chat website, punchkickchokechat.com. Man, we're so stoked about that design. It looks awesome. The team that put that together, you know, we gave them a little bit of guidance and they just ran with it. It is incredible. And you can check out our old episodes. And then we drop different monthly, um, you know, seminars and things like that that we have in our in our digital library. So we really invite you to, to check that out. And if you like that and you think it's sexy, share it for us because uh, we appreciate growing this with you. Um, Sensei Bonner, what was it like growing up for you and what brought you into that first dojo? Um, I want to add one other thing to the knife discussion, if I can. Yeah, please. Uh, I think Sensei Legacy was alluding to that uh, when he said about giving something up. You have to expect to get cut. Mm. If you were in an encounter with someone swinging at you, you're probably going to get hit somewhere along the way. I mean, it's just part of it. No one gets out of that unscathed. You can look at enough matches of the most famous people that we've ever seen, like from Muhammad Ali and all the others. And they all get hit. So you just... That's why I want to mention, yeah. Um, martial arts. I, uh, like probably some of you, I found a Bruce Tegner book. <laughs> Bruce Tegner's karate book years and years ago. I don't remember how old it was. I, I could have been 13. I don't remember. Um, probably somewhere around there. And then uh, that got my interest. And it wasn't long after that or around that time that, you know, In Like Flint came out with James Colburn and then Jack, uh, Billy Jack, and those kind of movies were coming out. And I've always, I was always interested in that. I wanted to learn some skills that would protect me if um, someone was going to try to, to get physical. You know, when you're growing up, there's a lot of, there's a lot of that going on in schools and playgrounds and things like that and bullies. And I just, I gravitated toward it and I, I, I like um, I like movement. So I like playing hockey when I was, I used to play a lot of hockey and football. I'm not a golfer, if you know what I mean. And I don't bowl, nothing against that, but I like movement. So that attracted me that that movement and, and the fitness and the things that went with that. And then, um, what brought you into the first specific dojo you went into? And then what was that experience like? Let's see if I can remember here. Uh, <laughs> I really believe the first school I went to, I, it was right around, it was a, just a private thing. And I don't remember if I was there two nights or one time or whatever it was. I just, I just heard about it. And then you don't know about people training. Uh, and I believe the guy's name was Park Hip. And there was another guy working with him. And I don't remember the name at all. And they were just showing some things and you learn a few things. And then I don't know that I went back because I, I don't remember how old it was now. If I even had the money to pay for it. Um, then after that, um, I believe the next place I actually went to was on Dundas Street East down by the Old Park Theater. And there was a school there. I think it was called London School of Self-Defense or London School of Health and Self-Defense or something like that. I remember, I don't remember how long I trained there. I know that Harold Warden ran it because I remember meeting him then. And I, I think I joined for a year or something like that, but I, I didn't stay there. Um, I sustained a hockey injury and stuff like that and hurt my knee pretty bad. So that affected things. But And I, and I met a couple of people there that um, actually only one person I can even think about, one of the instructors that taught some classes for him. And um, after that, I don't think my serious training got involved until I moved to Sarnia and met Ralph Chinnick. And so uh, at Harold Wardens, did you and Hanchi Legacy cross paths at all? Or do you have any memories about him you'd want to share? Did, did Or did you just say you didn't even uh, train with him? What I might remember, if I, if I can, is that I remember being in the class one time and Harold would walk out and he'd say, this is what I want taught or something like that. And I remember uh, Sensei Legacy may have been one of the instructors then. And then there was a guy, Bob Fulcart, 
and they and he was there. I remember him. I think he was a blue belt at the time or something. Um, and then teaching some things, but that's that might have been the only crossing of paths that we would have had at that time, or at any time, for, you know, for that matter. Yes, unless what he has different recollection. Hachi, you got any memory of that time or, or or those? Well, I'm just gonna say, if I was at the school and there was a class, I would have been there. Okay. I never missed any classes ever. Okay. I, that's I'm not bragging. I'm just saying. So uh, we seem to have a lot in common with Harold Warden. I know Ralph Chinnick very well, and um, um, I even uh, and Wallace Slokey was also uh, one of my instructors during that time. Yes, and um, I even read Bruce Tegner's book. I know when you said it, it's, it rang a bell for sure. Yeah, <laughs> so we're around the same era, and yeah, uh, probably when you, uh, you moved away, and and then I started to progress even more. Right. It's about you anyway. So right. it seems like Sensei, you moved from Sarnia to London, and then Sensei Bonner left London and moved to Sarnia. So you guys were crossing each other on the highway. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, um, so Sensei Bonner, when you ended up down there in Sarnia, you, you got a little more serious with it, and that's when you started to to well, it was very interesting. Room. When I walked into Ralph School and kind of interesting and ralph and i became very good friends unfortunately he passed away a few years ago um, um and when i went in there i said to him he says what are you looking for and i says well i'm looking for the secret and he just smiled at me and he said well, what's the secret i said well there's got to be something you guys do that make these things work with your kicks and your punches and other stuff i mean i understand what boxing looks like but you know, you've got to, there's got to be something about someone putting you in a headlock or choking you or doing things. I said, well, what's the myth behind all this? And I'll never forget it. He and I used to joke about this all the time. Years later, when I ended up becoming instructing for him, and um, purchased his school from him and that, he said to me, if you sign up, I'll show you the myth. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was, uh, yeah, well, yeah, he used to always tease me about that. And you know what? I, I got some great answers. This is why this is different. You know, if someone grabs you and does something too, here's some here's some answers to the questions you're running into. So, and the myth's still growing, by the way. That's a bonner. I used to always when I'd be in Sensei Legacy's classes. I think I might even done it with some Sensei Sfino's classes. If people didn't show up and then I saw him, I'd be like, "You missed the class. He taught all the secrets." <laughs> He got all the secret stuff, and he said it was because you weren't there. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, Sensei Bonner, I'd love to jump into this idea, and then we'll go around the horn on it. The idea of the importance of the myths and what myths are true. You know, we all come in with a conception. We all come in watching these movies. We all come in thinking, I call it uh, standing on the tip of the sword, like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and what myths are true and what, how important is it to have them? That's a good question. Well, I still, I'm, I'm still learning, as you know, I'm still training, I'm still working with, uh, with Guru Rick Fay and then uh, Professor uh, Dragon there in Waterloo. Um, what are the myths? The, the, the truth is this, if you're gonna if you're gonna be proficient in this, it's kind of like this. I'll quote Guru Inosanto. He said a lot of people think of the martial arts like an iceberg, and all they see is what's on the surface, and they see what some people would term as violence or fighting or, or techniques or things like that. But the greatest bulk of every of that iceberg is under the surface. And until you actually are gonna immerse yourself and get training and develop, and you understand fitness and mobility and flexibility and agility and, and different types of body motion and how things are executed and why that technique works at this point, but doesn't work at this point. You don't get into that. It's still a mystique to you. And then the more you learn that mosaic gets a little clearer and a little clearer and a little clearer. And now all that picture starts coming together. I see what fits and what doesn't fit in or when it fits and how it fits. Um, and I'm still intrigued by that. I just love, just love learning and seeing how these things work. And I think one of the myths, to be honest with you, would be 
because it's going to take work, it's going to take time and dedication, is um, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it all the time and they wouldn't quit. So it takes, you're going to have to work for it. You guys know that very well. Um, and you can make this statement. I've asked people this from time to time. True or false, any technique will work. And a lot of people go, yeah, I said, but against who? <laughs> and that's the difference. So you might have some techniques you can pull off with certain people, but at what level could you pull that off when you're training and practicing and having fun? Or if you're competing or something, and the other people go, I can't make that work on that person. Yeah, because they're at a different level. So you work towards that level. So I think that's part of the myth that I've got the answer now. If someone ever really attacks me, I can do this and this and this. Mike Tyson had that famous quote. Um, Everyone's got a plan until they get hit. And that, that changes everything again, right? So those would be some things I would think about. Yes. Right on. Um, Hanchi Legacy, what about you? What are some of the myths that are true and how important is it to have the myths for the martial arts? What people see and what's going on sometimes are two different things. I'll tell you the whole secret right now. It's uh, you heighten your senses. That's it. You heighten your senses. From practicing, you get to, uh, you move first. You start to notice when a technique starts, you don't need to watch it all the way through until it's going to hit your chest. You recognize it when it's leaving chamber first, right? You react first and you'll start first. And I'll give you a bit of an idea of what I mean. You know, you're out on the, on the highway driving your car and you're driving at, let's say safely 115 kilometers an hour and you've driven from Toronto to St. Thomas, and then you get off on Highway 80, how slow do you think you're going? You're going, man, am I ever going slow, right? Do you, do you ever get that feeling? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, from training, just like a National Hockey League goaltender, when they, when they warm up, he stands there and they fire the puck at him at about 100, 110 miles an hour. How often do they get a shot away like that during a game? They don't because they're being bothered by other players. So they fired the puck at them to get the proprietary receptors being used to higher, faster movement. And by training, that's what happens to your body. And you pick everything up in your, in your eye system, your proprioceptors, and then from training, you react first. Mm. So your, um, your, um, reaction timing gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And as soon as another person starts to move, you're already in on them and hitting them. And they seem like it's superhuman, but it's not. It's just plain standing out there and watching and training all the time. And that gives you the advantage on everyone most of the time, in my opinion. Thanks, Anchi. Um, Sensei Suino, um, how important are the myths and what are some that are true? I don't know how, they're import how important they are for other people. I still have this, this idea that I had when I was a kid. You know, I still think there's this unlimited sort of Kung Fu Panda level uh, power out there that's possible. And if I just train hard enough, I'll get there. And every now and then you have these days where you feel like you're getting close, right? You just do these amazing things. Um, uh I think the reality is kind of as Hanchi said, you know, you train and train and train and you learn to see better than others. One of my teachers, Walter Todd, who's one of the early pioneers who came back from Japan after World War II, used to say, you know, he would just tell new martial artists, come in here and do a forward roll and I'll tell you what rank you are. Hmm. You know, and I'm a, I'm a young kid. I'm like, bullshit, man. But he was remarkably good at it. And now, you know, 30 years later, you know, someone comes in my dojo, I can say, oh, I want to throw that guy with Seo Inage. I, I can pretty much tell you how long you've been training. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's not mystical. It's just you've been at it so long, you know what to look for. And uh, it's almost intuitive after a while. That's kind of my take on it. Thanks, Sensei. Sensei Dolphin? Funny, because he said it's not mystical, but it is to people who don't have that mystique. <laughs> it's mystical to them, right? And I think that's, so why are they important, Sean? They do motivate people. They keep people going, right? The myths and the, like, 
I think that's a good thing. Like anything that motivates people, keeps them in the dojo, keeps them training. That's a good thing. Like I say it about the karate masters all the time. I tell the black belts in here, like when you're teaching the kids class, build those masters up like, like giant and then tell those kids they can do that too. Mm. Don't, don't crush Santa Claus on them, right? Like don't take Santa away from them and they'll figure that out on their own, right? They'll, they'll eventually get to that spot. Nobody needs to burst that bubble. What are some of the myths I think, or misconceptions or um, it's going to be like it is in the dojo. Like it's not going to be like it is. Mm. In the you, you spend all this time in here and you think your second one is going to be that way. No, it's not. You're going to be in running shoes. It's going to be an icy sidewalk. Um, you know, you, you're going to see it coming. Well, maybe you're not going to see it coming. And you better hope that your training lets you survive not seeing it coming mm. and get your wits about you so that you can overcome those things. That's a myth. Like, you know, in the dojo, you always see it coming. When do you not see it coming? Right? I mean, so, um, and then the other one is, uh, I think maybe for us is you get, well, Sensei Bonner said it earlier, him and I were talking about it, about rank and nobody cares like nobody gives a <laughs> shit when you get outside they don't care they don't they don't care if you're a seventh then and they don't care if they got their ass kicked by a seventh then they don't give a crap about that right? <laughs> like, they don't care bad guys don't care about that stuff <laughs> right on um i just want to chip in one thing before we get back you know one of the myths for me coming in was i pictured the monk like the quiet chain came like walking the earth and that's a myth that to me has proven to be true like metaphorically and literally like you can go anywhere without anything other than what's on your back and be fine and uh in and out and and i got that from this art and i am so excited to keep growing that that was one of the reasons i wanted to join was to be that monk and one day i woke up and i'm like i feel like that's actually a true thing not a tv show thing um sensei bonner talk to us about in as much or little detail like you can go with ideas you can go with specifics your path from the Kempo through the Shinkanru Jiu-Jitsu to meeting Wally Sloki to competing. Talk us through that for yourself. Uh, well, I I was introduced to Sloki Stanton through Ralph Chinnick and doing the Japanese Jiu-Jitsu. There was a lot of other involved with it with Daito Ru and it was so long ago now. And again, uh, Terry passed away a few years ago as well, um, unfortunately. He lived in Kansas City, so I'd fly down there and train there. He'd come up and do seminars at, at uh, Ralph School when he was in London for a while, and he'd come to my school and so on and so forth. So, but I, I've always been a guy that I've always played contact sports. And I remember a few times that I think one thing that really changed me there was we were always sparring. I, I didn't go to tournaments. I wasn't into that type of thing. Um... I appreciate what people do there, but it wasn't for me to do that. Um, but I'd be sparring with different people and you're having your fun. It's, you do your kicks and your punches and you're just having a good time with people. And then I had this friend of mine um, who was, uh, turned out to be a five-time Golden Glove champion in different tournaments. And I remember one day he came into a bunch of training and he said, can I spar you guys? And I had it with myself, about four or five, all, all of us who were training hard all the time. And, he just said, okay, I'll go each one of you guys one at a time. And when we're all done, we're done. And we were all done. And he embarrassed us really bad. And uh, he just boxed. He said, you can throw all the kicks you want. And so on and so forth. So then I went, okay. Um, through Ralph, I'm, I'm bringing that up for that reason. Through Ralph, Ralph brought Wally Sloki down. And then when I saw Wally do some things, uh, that was probably 75, I think, something like that. It's hard, it's hard to tell now that. Time flies so much, and I guess that doesn't matter either. But I was introduced to Wally then, and then um, so through that time, I was kickboxing was really picking up. We we're seeing more and more about kickboxing, and they called it PKA back then with the Joe Corley and Professional Karate Association. And mm -hmm. you're watching those things, and then I had people that I was training that wanted to get in kickboxing, and I'd work the corner and go to different matches and in Canada, and Ron Day was really big with those back in the day in, in Kitchener. Uh, Carrie Roop in Michigan was holding a lot of different um, K1 
kickboxing events and so on. And I was going to those and taking some fighters down there. And then I got the point. I said, you know what? I'd like to just do this myself now. Mm. Um, I was older. I was 31, I think, when that started. But I'd already been, you know, always training, always sparring, doing stuff. And that's, I met Leo um, probably just before that. Um, he remembers when. He, he, he knows the date because he was... Uh, he was 14. I think I was 17 or 18. So whatever those days work out to our, to our date of birth, we, we can figure that out. But anyways, when I want to train, I've always, one of the things I've, I've done is I've always searched out at a certain stage of my life. I've always searched out what I considered the elite in what they were doing. Mm. Now that doesn't mean I, there was a bunch of people that weren't, but I just didn't know about them. So all I knew about kickboxing and, and full contact was Wally Sloki. I thought if I'm going to train, I'm going to go to Toronto and train under that man if he'll take me. So I drove down to Toronto. I called him up first, drove down. He said, come on down. I'll talk to you. I'll take you through a workout. And I'll let you know whether I think I want to train you. Maybe you, we don't, hopefully we'll connect. Or if I think you have it or don't have it. So I, I and every week I drove down to Toronto after that. I just started training. And uh, the things that, that he taught me, um, he gave me the ability, and I, I, I want to say this in a respectful way, but he gave me the ability to have confidence um, and knowing for certain that you could knock somebody down or knock somebody out, or you could drop them with a body shot. I learned all that stand-up, the kicking and the punching, and that, that side of that game through Wally, all of it. Uh, that was a big part um, of that experience there. It's, you want me to go more on that area? Do you want to go past that time or just stop at that point? Well, I got a quick question for you then, and then I'd love to, to keep going with that. And it looks like Sensei Dauphin does too, but for me real quick, I want to know how you found yourself from France for that's for winning the European as a Canuck. How I ended up going there? Yeah, and winning that title there, or like of all places. It was in Reims, France. I believe it was in May. May, late May, early June. Um, well, Wally would, Wally's the type of guy, you know, those that know him, know his personality. And I showed up at his gym one day and he says, well, you better pack your bags. I said, why? You're going to France. I said, okay. And what for? And he told me what I was fighting for. Now, I didn't know this until I got there. And I used to have the poster for the event. And I don't know where it went, but I don't have the poster any longer. But I did have the poster for some time from the event because I got interviewed over there before the fight. I was there days early to train and get ready and so on, get acclimatized, everything. When I got there, it turned out that someone else was supposed to be on the card. And uh, they couldn't make it. They got injured or something from Canada. And so my name got inserted in through through that, with Wally, and that's how that came about. Um, I think I know who was supposed to fight at that time, but uh, that, that was kind of an interesting uh, when I got there. there. There's more to the poster, but it was an eye-opener with some of the questions I got from some of the reporters. Mm -hmm. I'll say it that way. <laughs> um, for somebody who's watching, and who's, you know, feeling at the front end of their dojo fighting, like they're feeling really good. And they're sparring and they're training in that karate or that tempo or that jiu-jitsu way. What would you tell them is the most significant leap they have to be able to take to go to that full contact kickboxing realm? Well, it's so prevalent anymore with MMA and the surge through Thai boxing and all that. Um, man, there's just so many people that are into that. They just like the contact from other sports. Um, you, you have to get that toughness that it's not a point tournament. Now they're not going to pull their punch. They, the person there on the other side would like to hurt you if they can. Uh, I don't mean maliciously, but when you're, when you're fighting and they bring in their friends and they're watching and, um, they don't want to look bad in front of everybody. And I got Wally schooled me that way. Cause he'd bring in different, different boxers at different levels. Um, pro boxers, amateur boxers, and kickboxers. And I got to spar with people that were really talented, 145 pounds and up. Uh, you got the feel of what it was like to get hit. I remember there was a guy that, that he introduced me to, and I'm glad he was very nice. It was Conroy Nelson. 
in time right now. So if you look at some old fight films, I think he went four rounds with Mike Tyson. Ooh. And I had a headgear on with a steel nose cage, which I'm really glad I did. And he had about a, if I'm correct, Muhammad Ali's reach from what I remember was, was 80. And I think his reach was longer than that. I couldn't, he could stick his hand on, I couldn't touch him with my foot. So he hit me with a right hand one time and I spun 180. I still faced him, I still had my hands back up. And he said, and he was Jamaican, he was, you okay, man? I said, yeah. <laughs> and you know what I mean? But if you're not used to that, or if you get hit with a liver shot or you get hit hard in the solar plexus, um, Wally brought a guy in, I believe his name was Willie Featherstone. I think at the time he was Canadian light heavyweight champion. And he was very, very, very good to work with. He would hit you. And then if you saw that he startled you or got you with a good body shot and you lost your wind or whatever else, he would just back off where, where he could have went in and finished. And he would say, okay, keep moving around, work through it, work through it. And a lot of people have to get past that point of the shock of, a, of something actually hitting you. But if they played hockey or football, they're used to that type of contact. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a really big part of it. That's an eye opener when someone really hits you. And then the myth comes in that when you hit somebody, how well, if I just hit him with this, uh, you'd be surprised when pe people are conditioned to things, the type of punishment somebody can take, which we've seen many times over the years mm. in, in different contact sports, right? Like, you know, whether it's boxing or kickboxing or MMA and that people can take a lot of punishment. It's not as not as uh, clear cut as it as it seems at times unless you find the sweet spot uh, and that's a different thing uh, um Hans, i saw you nodding along there when he just talked about it's not a point they're trying to knock you out is there anything you want to add to that or comment on that's toughness is the key word there like when you go in there you you gotta you gotta be a tough guy and and i agree with you fully on that like you see like leo was a beautiful young man when he came in at, I think he was 11 years old but some of his looks started to change he didn't get beat up that much but his looks started to change as you see uh, GSP for instance you look at his ears and stuff like that you, when you're going to be a fighter you got to find that toughness or that will to be hit and and continue could I ask another question though is when you went to to Toronto to train with Wally Stoker. Do you remember what year that was about? Uh, and, and you don't have to be exact, but I, I wanted to ask you this. Did you run into Benny Allen? No, I've heard the name over the years. I've never met the man in my life, no. Uh, uh, he was Wally's immediate teacher and I was just wondering uh, whether you've run into him, you most likely always would have to run into Benny Allen back in those days. Um, but depending on the year. At Wally's club, that was at, this was, this was mid 80s. It could have been 84, 85, it could have been 86. I think I mentioned there was 85 to 88, but I think it was somewhere around that time. I know I didn't have my first match until. It was one in October of 86, I believe, in London. Um, and there was one before that in, this, in May, May or June, in Toronto before that. I went into the ring. Uh, so I'm trying to think of the time frame you're asking. I went into the ring and the other fighter didn't show up. So it was a, it was a win by not having a competition. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> that, was my, that was my first event. Yeah. All my friends came down from oh, London and that, and I never got to fight. So yeah, no, oh, that's too bad. But with Wally, no, um, nobody like that. The only people I was introduced to or met down there were um, boxers and kickboxers and things like that. Thanks, Sensei. Um, Sensei Suino. Yeah, um, Sensei Bonner, I'd I'd like to ask you this. We're talking about toughness and. So far, mostly in the context of striking, um, but you're you've spent some time on the ground, um, as I have, and um, there's a there's an element of toughness there. And I would love to hear kind of your thoughts on that. How do you move through difficult situations? There's pain, there's fear, there's the potential joint injuries. 
Um, what do you think about the relationship, if there is one, between the kind of toughness you need to get in the ring with somebody who's striking versus rolling around? Well, it can only hit you so many different ways. You know, you're either going to throw a jab or a right or an overhand or an uppercut or, you know, you're throwing a hook or things like that um, or a, some type of spinning motion you might run into. But on the ground, there's so many variables, like from the mount to the guard, the side control and so on, and whether you're in butterfly or spider guard or whatever, there's just so many variables. Um, it's a different, it's a different type of toughness. As far as the joints and the injuries, um, I like to train with people. I, we have a sign that I picked up from Gru or Rick Fay, and I've kept it for years. Train with your partner, not on your partner. Mm. We're not competing against one another. I'm just going to work with you and we're going to try to get better together. And then sometimes, you know, you slap hands and pump fists and you go, okay, let's uh, see how we go. I'm quick to tap if I think someone's going to get something. Uh, I'm quick to tap because I don't need the injuries because the injury means downtime and I'm not training. So I set my ego aside. I don't care. Hey, you got me. That was a great choke. You got me. That's good. And a lot of times, because the people I work with, I like to have fun with. So I'm always chirping and chat, trash talking to them. When, when they think they've got an Americana on me or a choke, and I go, you don't have it. You don't have it. You don't have it. But in my mind, I'm thinking, it's almost there. You know, it's almost there. <laughs> and I realize they got me. And I just keep talking. You don't have it. Because sometimes I've done that. And they've let go. They've changed a bit because it wasn't working. Other times they just go, you got me here. Yeah, that was good. Good for you. And then we just keep on training. I just want to work and get better. So I tap early. I don't have an ego on that. I don't want to train with anyone. Even now when I spar with people, I don't even wear a mouth guard and I don't wear a headgear. I just said, look, if I got to spar with you and think that the only difference between now and the striking part then as far as my approach, what's the difference between sparring somebody that you're still throwing the same punches, same with grappling, you're still doing the same techniques, whether you're um, whether you're, you're submitting somebody in a different position, whatever, or in the striking part of it, what we're talking about that is um, what's the difference between someone going light and someone going heavy? They're still going to throw good techniques, but the difference is what is your intent? And you can't let your guard down because you're going to pay for it. So I spar with people that we can still have fun, get a good workout in, we can laugh. Uh, we try to outfox one another, have fun. But we never take advantage of a complete opening. You, you pull everything, and it's a reminder. Oh, you know, I got hit the other day with a with a nice stiff jab because I was daydreaming and I was going to ask the guy a question, and he saw the little hesitancy. While he's always telling me, "Don't fall asleep with this guy," but you know, and he smacked me, and he goes, "What were you thinking?" I said, "I'm going to ask you a question about where you're going on vacation next." <laughs> and he saw the hesitation, so he smacked me. You know what I mean? And I like that, but there's no intent. The intent, you know, you guys are all full grown adults. If you were to spar a 10 year old, would you hit them hard? Of course not. So if you learn to spar people at that level, young boys, young girls, and so on, when you're sparring other people, the difference is what is your intent or not. And Bill Wallace, when you do seminars with him and he'd spar, you tell everybody, I'll spar anyone that wants, just tell me up front. Do you want to go light, medium, or hard? I need to know up front, you know. And then we just do that. Let's just go light, move around, have a good time. I just want to work with you. That's all. Love I hope that. that answers kind of what you're looking for there. Um, Sensei Suino, I'd like to throw that question right back at you. What do you think the difference is? You know, you and I have done stand up. You've come up for seminars. And then what do you think the difference is between that toughness or the ground toughness? Uh, well, I guess the same part of it is you have to have some. I mean, it sounds stupid, but... Uh... You know, I, I don't know that I'm a great striker, but I I can I can take a punch. I have taken many of them. Sometimes it hurts. Move through it. Um, I got more experience on the ground dealing with pain. And uh, Sensei Bonner, I'm right with you in terms of what I do these days. But that hasn't always been the case, um, both in terms of my own meatheadedness in the past. And also, I used to tolerate a lot more of that at my dojo. Um, and so I've been in situations where people have, you know, inflicted pain or injury on me. And uh and you know learn to move through it to get to the other side um it sounds to me like that's real similar to to uh uh what you're talking about inspiring is you know take a punch and keep moving right uh get a choke and don't submit move through it 
if you can. Um, sometimes you get an injury, but if it's important, you know, Gordon Ryan did that the other day, uh, a few weeks back in that tournament, right? He got a broken foot, kept moving because he wanted to win. Um, that's a skill that I think we need in the combatives. Um, I'm not so sure. Uh, uh, I'm not so sure I want to train that way anymore, <laughs> but it's definitely useful when you need it. You know, it's funny you say that because Donahue was talking about Gordon Ryan years ago with an ACL tear before the final. And he said, can you win? And he goes, if he's like, I don't know if I can win, I wouldn't have let him compete because I don't want him to go get more hurt just to make a showing. And then Gordon was like, I can win. And he goes, okay, fine, go do what you got to do because you need the operation anyways. And I thought that was an interesting way to approach the toughness. Like if it's just a loser's game anyways, you're already tough. But if you can actually win, what's an extra month of recovery? <laughs> like, I don't know, like you know. That. That's a lot more calculated. You know, the last time I had to go through something like that, we had a guy at J-Mac who was, who was a little dangerous and I tolerated it way too long. And I remember one time he and I were grappling really hard and I'm, you know, half his size. And I was just in that stupid mindset of, I'm going to prove this guy what an idiot he is, you know, and we all know how that those things turn out. Um, and uh, in the course of a big struggle on the ground, I, um, I've separated my, my collarbone and had that whole rush of, you know, what happens when you get a big injury, right? The nausea and all the, mm -hmm. all the stuff, but I didn't, you know, this is the meathead. There was nothing, there was no world champion. There was nothing coming out of that except this stupid ego. Um, and so I got it through it and I was happy that I made it through, but it was, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a high cost and I didn't even get a shitty silver medal to take home and hang on the fireplace. <laughs> Um, I think I've been there, Sensei. Um, before we go to the 10 questions, Sensei Dolphin, I just, you you had a real connection to that concept of like the can you win, keep going, and if not, maybe don't. Is that something you want to comment on or something around that? Yeah, I don't, that's a, your big strengths can also be your big weaknesses, right? Sean, I'm, I'm a competitor. I like to compete. Um, I like to win. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just being honest about it. Um, and as a matter of fact, when I started doing BJJ, that was one of the first things that Sensei Suino cautioned me about. He said, Randy, you're a guy who likes to win and you like to figure out ways to win. You're not going to learn well if you go to BJJ and try and win all the time. So now when I pull in the parking lot for whatever the last nine months, as I get out, I just say, you're a white belt. Just get in there and learn, learn some stuff. Mm. And Dan Holland, who's on, he said, Randy, just fight for position. Like if you can get good position, then that's a win. Right. And so now I've just changed my win to from domination of something like choking somebody unconscious to, Hey, I broke the grip. That's a win. Yeah. Right? That's a win. So I'm just feeding my competitiveness on a smaller scale than I like to, but I was nodding mostly Sean about the, the toughness stuff, right? Yeah. Like, because sense of legacy training me from the beginning, I can't, it's innumerable how many times he said to me, expect to get roughed up, expect to get roughed up. You need to expect to get roughed up. You're going into a fight. The other guy's trying to expect to get roughed up. Yep. And I've just always had that mentality whenever like we put the gear on. It's amazing. You go to BJJ and so many people like they smack you in the face or something. And they're like, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm like, it's all good. Like, it's fine. Right. Like, yeah. cause I'm expecting to get roughed up when expect I get in there. Like, that's my mindset. It's such a great term. Expect to get roughed up. Um, Sensei Bonner, we ask all our guests the same 10 questions. We ask that you answer as impulsively as you can, but then feel free to elaborate if you wish. Could um, I, uh, can I mention something more about that last part? Oh God. Yeah. Okay. There is, there is a toughness that, that is important that you're able to work through a challenge. And there's a time when you're working, you're sparring people, rolling different people, and they challenge you. And I like that part where, you know, you don't do it all the time, but they you get people that you know that are are matched up or better, especially if they're better, it's great. Um, to work through that challenge and realize, you know what, uh, you know, I survived, I got through that, I did okay, and you know, um, I like that. There's something about. Leo will tell you this. We talked about many times. There's something about sparring with someone, and if they land a shot, you go, "Oh, good. Now I'm now I'm in the game." Yeah, because you felt something. And there's, you know, you guys are nodding. I can see that. Yeah, and people don't understand. You go, "You actually like that hip?" Yeah, I do like it. So, 
because then you really feel alive and you're able to work some stuff. Um, I think there's a, a big part of toughness there, but with that toughness comes smarts about, okay, that's good enough. I don't mm. need to go any harder or any further. I know when to, when to say, okay, let's take a break. Like we're talking grappling or whatever else. All right. Thank you. Yeah. That's yeah. Well, one thing Sensei Delfin always says, and I pass it on to my students, like once you've been to the wars, you don't need to keep proving you can go to the wars. And right. I, you know, I really appreciate that perspective. Um, what is the most effective move in your martial arts arsenal? <laughs> I don't know that I have one. I, I think it's, um, I guess experience, mm -hmm. just experience and seeing so many different things that after a while, I think Sensei, Sensei Legacy alluded to that about you just kind of, this looks like that. Mm. And you don't, you don't get surprised as easily because you've seen that so many times at so many different levels that you go, okay, I, I see what your game is. I see what you're up to. Uh, I think the experience is, is probably the best thing for me. Keeping distance, oh, wow. keeping range. I think footwork and mobility is, is, um, comes before anything else. Um, if you're not there, you can't be hit. If you can move, you're out of the way, right? I think that's important, but yeah. Right on. You saw a lot of nods on the call there. Um, who is uh, the most influential martial artist in your life? In my life? Yeah. Well, they've been at different times, as we talked about. Um, Ralph Chinnick. Uh, Ralph was very, uh, his whole program with the Tracy back then, it was all for the street. Um, you mentioned earlier, and I'm glad you didn't ask me, uh, you don't want to see me perform a kata. Okay, and that's very good at any level. <laughs> uh, I, I appreciate the people that could that perform beautiful katas. Um, so Ralph Chinnick was very important there. Uh, I wasn't as close to Terry. It was good to train with him, and I learned a lot. And I went through a lot of pain learning those, learning those different locks because he he liked to set them. Let me tell you, you were tapping, and he'd still be talking about. Now, if you had this little variable, and you go, oh, God, are you kidding me? Man, I feel like I'm going through the ringer here with some of this stuff. But they were, they were very effective locks. I mean, I have very high respect for yeah. wrist and joint locks and shoulder locks. And that this, I'm talking obviously the Japanese jitsu for different things, uh, like on the ground. I'm thinking of other art people I work with. Um, the most influential in my life, though, would be um, I would, you know, obviously Wally played a huge part in, in my training and growth and, and skill development. That. Um, I'm going to have to say between Dan and Asano and Rick Fay, Dan and Asano first, because I was started training with him through that. I met Rick and he's a very close friend. And, um, I just see, um, you know, Dan likes to say that, you know, I'd rather be a jack of all trades and be able to fit into any environment and things and appreciate other arts and other cultures than be a, specialist in one area and be out of my element when I don't want to be out of my element. You know, you need, you need to stand up, you need the ground, you need all the different ranges, whether it's kicking, punching, trapping, grappling, stand up, grappling uh, on the ground. Um, and the, and the way they teach, but I have to say it would be uh, Dan Inasano and Rick Faye for sure. And then right now, Professor uh, Jevick in uh, Waterloo, he's very influential in but if I were to look to one person, if someone said, you can't train with anyone else for the rest of your life, except one, I'd go to Minnesota. I'd train with Rick Fay. Right on. Who do you believe is the most influential martial artist of all time and why? Pardon me? Who do you believe is the most influential martial artist of all time and why? Okay, sorry, I didn't hear that. But, um, I think the most influential is probably uh, probably Bruce Lee. Um, he brought he probably got more people into into people's dojos and and schools and clubs and training than probably anybody else did. Um, he still he put his page he put his picture. I haven't seen magazines for years, but up until when I was looking at him, you put a picture of him on a magazine and they usually sell it. There's some story yeah. or some article inside it. Very influential. Um, People think of him as a, 
well, he was just a martial, a martial art movie star in that. But if you go back to, if you really know the, the history of the man, the train and the things that the people like Guru and Asana would talk about him. I mean, Joe Lewis and Chuck Norris didn't train with him because he didn't have a skill set, didn't have any abilities. Uh, Joe Lewis talked heavily about all his training with, with uh, Bruce Lee, Chuck Norris and them, and not just a movie, but the training they did. They met at a, I think they met at a tournament and they trained, they, afterwards they were up all night all night long talking and exchanging techniques and training ideas and that. So I think he's probably easily the most influential martial artist of all, of all time. Thanks. That's it. Um, what excites you most about the next five years of your training? Um, getting, understanding BJJ better and getting better at it and being able to teach other people and pass that on and, watch them develop passion and start from scratch and get better at it and then start doing things to you that you're doing to them they don't have an answer for it yet yeah i love i just love training i really like training all the time and you got to stay fit you got to stay you know motion is lotion so you've got to keep moving you've got to keep doing things right as you get older um i would say that yeah where i how far i can go in and then still honing other skills if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you get there? I believe it exists. Um, well done, good and faithful servant. Love it. Um, do you have a favorite film and television martial artists? Maybe they're not even legit martial artists, but do you have a favorite action or martial arts star? I do not. Right on. Yeah. Um, is there a martial artist, living or dead, in all of history who you'd want to train with the most? I'll answer that other question there first. Yeah, uh, probably Bruce Lee movies. Yeah, I, I like watching him for sure. Right on. Um, a martial artist living or dead right now? Mm. Bruce Lee. Mm. I'd have questions for him for sure. At least I got the closest source to it, being Guru and Asano. But, uh, <laughs> for real. For real. Yeah. Um, if everyone in the world could have the greatest benefit you've gotten from martial arts, whether they train or not, what benefit would they get? Wow. You, the benefit they would get is be involved in training that if you look after yourself and all things go well with your health, you can do for the rest of your life. Mm. Keep your flexibility build your confidence up, your mobility, uh, your reflexes, your movement. Um, I would say that the martial arts, they all offer that in some form or another. If you can say it that you can be a martial artist for the rest of your life and still perform and do very well at, at, at advanced age when you see people that, that are in their 80s and they're still moving around like they're in their 40s, like Guru and Asano, and you go, seriously, you, you know what I mean? I, I would say that, that the arts offer that for sure. I'm not into the philosophy a lot and the other stuff. I need more of the, the training and, and the cultures and the arts and the disciplines and the skill sets and things like that. Um, I literally said to Sensei Dauphin the other day, it's like a fountain of youth. He goes, it's not like a fountain of youth. It is a fountain of youth. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We spent yeah, like some time that. meditating on that. Um, our last two questions come as a pair for our 10 questions. What's your greatest achievement and your greatest regret? Oh, I think my greatest achievement would be that I still love training and I still love learning martial arts from other people that, that, that teach me and so on. And my greatest regret for martial arts, I, I would say this as a word of advice. There are times you think, well, one of these days I'm going to get into training a certain thing, or I'm going to train under so and so. I would advise you to do it because mm. life changes in moments' notice, and some of those people aren't here no more, or some of those opportunities don't show up again. Um, I would say stay with that and search out as much as you can to keep going because the opportunities are there, they might pass. And with that, your learning curve sometimes can really take you a while to pick back up um, for your training. You, you've got to stay at it. 
That's awesome. Thanks, Sensei. Um, so I want to get back to your, your path and talk about your work with the cops or the police officers. But um, we have a question in from Mal Mark Altamari, who, you know, had two sign-ins earlier. So two sign-ins deserves a question being asked. Plus, it's a question I think we can all benefit from hearing the answer. Speaking of avoiding injuries, his question is, uh, what, if any, significant injuries have you had and how did it affect your training and your approach? I've been very fortunate. Um, the injuries I had were all minor until a couple of years ago. And then I sustained an injury at work. Uh, one one correction there. I was I'm not a police officer. I never I was never a police officer. Oh, I thought you had worked with them though. Oh yeah, I've trained them in military and things like that. But I, I thought you mentioned a police officer. Sorry, I just want to make sure that yeah yeah I'm right on right officer. on. I had utmost respect in the world for that profession. Um, sorry, your question again. Sorry. Oh, just um in terms of avoiding injuries. Right. Have you had any significant injuries, and uh, how did it affect your training and your approach? Okay, very good. Thank you. Yeah, a few years ago, I sustained a, a three major tear in rotator cuffs. I tore three of them right off and had to have them surgically with pins in my shoulder put back on. So I had 15 months of rehab to do that. Um, everything I do now, there's not one movement I do without thinking about my shoulder. What's this going to cost me? Mm. So I'm very protective of that. So I modify my training that I have healed up the best is what they say we could do. And then I keep working that, get back to as much as I can to what I did before. And there are certain things I've had to modify training um, just so that I don't undo what that expert worked on and all the, all the months of um, pre-surgery, physio to get ready for that. Because I got injured in April, but because of the lockdowns and COVID, I didn't have, um, I didn't even get to see a surgeon until August. I got surgery in, in August, in September. So all that months was scar tissue. So I had to go through all, I wanted to get all that done, have the surgery, do the, do the rehab. So now I'm very, very protective of that. As any movements I make, uh, there's certain people, if I'm grappling, I don't let them touch that arm. I make sure I move in a certain way. The good thing about grappling, as you guys know, you're strong from your hips to your shoulders, keeping the elbows in. You're really safe there. Anything going out wide or up, you're in trouble for different things. And uh, so I, I just modify all that when I punch. I, I watch how I throw that and watch for that, that whipping motion. Um, that, that's the main things. I'm always thinking about don't push it. Don't sure. push it. Just be smart. Yeah. Right on. Um, I want to ask you about that time. What what led you to stop doing that uh, kickboxing level, you know, where you're competing for titles and move more into something like, you know, training law enforcement and, and, and looking at tactical situations and moving away from the competitive end? Um, well, I'm very competitive by nature. I think it was just a time in life when there was a time when the fights were so few and far in between. I didn't have... Uh, near the fights like Leo had and, and all his long career in that. So um, I think it was mostly that that changed. My interest started to change about getting ready and competing and you might fight in June, but then you might not fight again until next January. Right. They were so stretched out after a while. I was like, okay. And um, I think running my school, I remember talking to Wally and he was saying, look, just focus on your school right now. And so I was focusing on, keep my school going and training students and so on. I think that was the biggest thing. Right on. And then how did that, and, and how did that lead to, to working, you know, in more practical type situations? Was that uh, part of your school itself or was that in something that were, were you went out and looked for that opportunity or they came to you or <laughs> talk to us about that? Through law enforcement? Yeah. Well, that was through some of my students. Um, it started with, um, some of my students that were training with me, one of them was a, uh, he was the team leader of a, t of a TAC team, which I won't mention who they were. And he said to me one day, I think you could help my guys out. I said, okay. So that started from there and then working with um, drug officers and so on and so forth and kind of built from there. And I got to learn 
their job and what they do and so on and develop um, training and skills that would help make their job safer and performance safer and, and all those other factors. And that's where that kind of led into that. Right on. And then one of the things that I'm always so curious about, and I know a couple of my students who can't be on the call tonight, they're, they're always really curious about this kind of thing. How much do you have to adapt what you know to be the classical martial arts for what you'd call that, like first through the door, first responder type of situation? Or how much are you like, no, it pretty much directly applies? That's a really good question. It's altogether different. Uh, I think I, I would say this, a lot of martial artists had difficulty trying to work with law enforcement because they don't understand the nature of their restrictions in their job and how they're governed and what rules and regulations they, they have to follow and they, they go under. Um, and the techniques have to fit have to be modified to fit the situation and so on. And even then, someone has to be justified with their actions and so on. They're always accountable for everything. It's, uh, and it's gotta be very simple. It's gotta be very simple, very practical. It can't be something that involves a lot of fine motor skill. And that's, that's a huge uh, change for that. And then where it fits and how it would work and so on. Yeah, that's a good question. It's yeah, very right different. On. Very different. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. What you're talking about, even just in terms of legalities, like what uh, <laughs> rifling someone in the side of the head is probably not allowed to be your first response. <laughs> no, you're very responsible. Um, <laughs> you have to be very responsible for your action. You got to be accountable for everything. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to something and go around the horn on it. And I'll I'll start with you, um, Sensei Bonner. Um, you talked about, and I wrote it down, it's, it's one of the deepest things I've heard you say tonight, just if there's something you're thinking of doing, if there's someone you're thinking of training with, I would advise you to do it. And that's just what I wrote down. I would, it's such a simple sentence, but you know, you, you're so not wrong about that, that time can pass by and the opportunity can just be gone. Do you have a missed opportunity in your martial arts? Do you have somebody you wish you trained with, or you were about to get on a train and go meet them and you didn't, and then you lost the chance? And I'm going to be asking everybody this. Did you have a missed opportunity in martial arts? I had one major one. I had some students in Michigan that were coming over. They would train with me. And they would say to me, um, hey, Dan Anasano in Michigan this week. I'm doing a seminar. You should go. And I knew who he was, and we've all saw things and we saw a game of death and he was in that and he had a book out you know and so on and i remember saying to them listen most of my focus is all on the stand-up and locks and so on i'm not into the weapons so much well come to find out later so that was about 82 so i i waited from 82 to 89 89 or 90 when I went to my first seminar. And that was, I looked and went, you just blew eight years, seven or eight years, because you all you could think about was sticks and knives. And here this guy comes out, he's doing sea lot, which is a beautiful, beautiful art. He's doing Filipino uh, boxing, which is Panantukan, which is very different. He's doing Thai boxing, he's doing shoot wrestling. And then we're also going to do some stick work and do some knife work. And then we're doing all that trapping from, from JKD and so on and so forth. And you had your mind made up that it was going to be weapons. Um, that was a big missed opportunity. So I missed seven or eight years there. But now you're getting, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's a long time. That's a long time. I would have, it would have enhanced my skill level when I was younger and those things so much quicker with, um, having been exposed to those arts and being able to learn it the way that they teach it, the way they, the way they conduct their seminars and teach it. So now yeah. I, that's where I live now. Yeah. Um, I'll start with you this time, Sensei. So we know we haven't started with you tonight. Um, do you have a missed martial arts opportunity then that goes along with the idea for anyone listening of like, don't miss the train? Watching my brain, um, man, I've trained with some amazing people. And, you know, after grad school, I, packed my bags and went to Tokyo and trained for four years because there were certain people I wanted to train with. Um, here's, here's what I missed. Um, I was in Tokyo training homesick after four years. 
I made the decision to come back to the States way too early. That was my big miss. There was some, there was some training to do with people who I had already been with for a long time. And, um, if I could go back and erase it, I would have, um, I would have stayed with them for another year or two years mm. or three years or who knows. Right. It was just too early to leave. Uh, but I was too homesick and, and I didn't realize that I, you know, you know, and I was eventually able to cycle back and train with them again. Um, but there's not too many people I missed training with that. I really wanted to, it was just the amount of time I spent with them. Right on. Um, Sensei Dofa, any missed martial arts opportunities? You well, you know who they'd be like, Benny Allen would be at the top of my list. I named my son after him. Like if I could have trained with it, he was alive when I was alive. I was training with Sensei Legacy when he was around. He'd be my number one, followed probably closely by Yamaguchi Sensei. He was in Canada. The dojo went. I didn't go to that seminar. I should have went to that seminar. Um, those are two big misses for me. Like just, I regret them all the time. I mean, I have that picture. Right there, I've said Legacy getting his black belt from Benny Allen. He gave it to me, and it says, Randy, don't wait until it's too late. That's what he wrote mm. across the picture, which is the exact same thing that Sensei Bonner just said. Mm. Randy, don't wait until it's too late. <laughs> right on. Um, Hanchi Legacy, any missed opportunities? Could have gone left and missed that chance. Well, I was really satisfied with my teachers, but uh, uh, I just want to say that I was 11 years old when Funakoshi was alive, and I missed that opportunity. And uh, it would be Ikihara from Okinawa, who we became really good friends. He retired, and the only students he will meet now in Okinawa are our students. Like, they go to the door, and he says to them, no more, no more. And they show him our crest. And he takes them in and teaches them. So uh, I myself would have liked to have trained longer with him. He was mm. a real good classical martial artist. Other Maybe. than that, I was really happy with my teachers. Uh, it was Benny Allen, Anthony Sandoval, those guys. Uh, uh, you only have so much time in your life. And I'm satisfied with who I did finally, it took me 10 years to hunt and then Anthony Sandoval down for the white crane. So um, for my lifetime and the time that I had, I'm very happy with my teachers. I'm even more grateful to them. Right on. Sensei Dauphin, you were gonna say? <laughs> uh, no, nothing, no, I was just talking about Sensei Legacy. Like it's, it's all good. Right on. Um, yeah, mine's brief. I mean, uh, I, I, I think I caught the tail end of Benny on, but I didn't know who he was then. And I missed a Richard Kim seminar, but didn't quite know what that meant at the time. So I don't have too great a regret. But when I first moved to Los Angeles, I told you Sensei Dauphin, I was like 20 blocks from Baz Rutten's fully like Beverly Hills Jiu Jitsu Club. And I was like, Oh, maybe I'll check that out one day. And I just never got there. And I was there at the early 2000s in that early explosion of Jiu Jitsu down there. And uh, I was also training stand up. So it would have been a lovely, I had the time, I had the energy uh, until I didn't. But that, that is a regret for sure. Um, I could train with Bonner. Was that? I could train with Nishiyama or Bass Rudin. Uh, you made the right choice, in my opinion. It was excellent. <laughs> it was excellent. But when that path ended, um, the other path could have picked up. <laughs> That's right. I, I picked up other paths. Sensei Bonner, um, if you if you know our show at all, you know what we like to do at the end is we go around the horn. So what we do is we, uh, starting with Hanchi Legacy, we, we talk about our time with you tonight. And then the last word, other than a little housekeeping, right at the end, we'll go to you. Um, so Hanchi Legacy, what do you want to say about our time tonight? Oh, the time was good. I, I enjoyed listening to uh, his side of it. I wish I had more time to talk about um, the training of the police officers. And if there is, maybe you can answer this. If there is, um, uh, let me see, whether there is an opportunity for martial artists to employ themselves in training police officers, um, that would have been interesting to find out for, for everybody, not just for us, but for all our listeners. 
And uh, he did cover some of it, which um, um, I was going to ask him about the extent of being able to use deadly, deadly karate or martial arts techniques against people in the street. But um, you answered that, Sensei Bonner. So other than that, it was great to meet you. I had heard about you during my, uh, my travels. I'm glad that I got to meet you. Uh, Boys, thank you. I hope to run into you sometime. Maybe when Leo and I get together, we can all get together. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Hanchi. Sensei Suino? Yeah, great conversation tonight. Uh, it just flowed by. I can't believe how, how quickly it went. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a wonderful aspect to what we do here because everybody's experienced in a variety of different ways and Sensei Bonner you bring a lot of different martial arts experience into the conversation uh different types of martial arts different scenarios the, the BJJ the striking uh the 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 law enforcement education um and to me that was just that was just interesting because your responses seem educated by all those different influences uh and you're measured in your in your answers uh but but uh but thoughtful and uh yeah, there was never a moment where I felt like the conversation lagged. It was really wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Sensei Suino. Sensei Dofat? Uh, I write lots of notes, uh, Sensei Bonner. I enjoyed the conversation a lot as well. Um, I can tell you're a not, no-nonsense person. Not a lot of um, flower and extra conversation, but to the point and uh, deep. Talked about knife fighting. I just wrote things. It was something you said you're going to get cut, right? Like that's, that's it. Um, I really enjoyed you talking about Harold Warden and being in that dojo. And I'm sure Sensei Legacy was there at some point um, at that time. Uh, I like that you said you're joining martial arts because you're looking for the secret. <laughs> like and mm. that's what you said to your instructor, I'm here for the secret. Um, I think it's actually kind of cool that you're training combat fighters, like people for kickboxing. And then at 31, you just said, well, I'm going to do this now too, <laughs> right? Like I'm around it. The people I'm teaching are doing it. So I'm going to do it too. Um, I like when you said that since as Loki said, well, you better pack your bags because you're going to France and that your name was the one that just got inserted. That's kind of funny. Um, your first win was a no-show. doesn't matter. You showed. He didn't yes. show that's still your win. That's a very legitimate win for me. And in my books, you showing up and that guy not showing up, that's actually a huge win. Uh, I like that you said your most effective move is experience and that there's levels to this because you said your most effective move is experience. And I was in my mind, I was like, yeah, there's levels to this game. And then you said, yeah, there's levels to this. So I, uh, I like that. That's, uh, Thank you. that's a good one. Um, Next five years that you just love training. Uh, motion is the lotion. I say that all the time. <laughs> like say that all the time. Um, God's gonna say to you, "Well done. You've been a good and faithful servant." I'm happy that you would say that. Um, I liked when we talked about regrets and waiting too long. Don't wait too long to do something. Um, that's a big one. And I feel things. That's why I feel I'm so busy now. Like because I just can't i just can't sit still there's too much stuff to do and not enough time to get it done um yeah i'm just really happy to have had john here uh sense of bonner like sense of legacy said if you know you and leo are together and we could all get together and shoot the shit and talk a little bit i'm sure it would be fun and we could maybe even talk about some stuff that we're not talking about on this show <laughs> very possibly yes um, thanks, Sensei Dauphin. You know, I just, I, I don't want to hammer it home too much, but just something about when you said that, I really clocked like time. You know, it's something Sensei Dauphin and I talk about, your, your potential's unlimited, your time isn't. And I just, when you said that, I just got really excited for my day tomorrow. I got really excited to fill my day tomorrow. Uh, I, I like some downtime, but the conscious filling of one's day and the path and thinking about, you know, the, the work I want to get writing on, et cetera. It was just, I don't know, something about our conversation I'd have found so chill and present. And uh, I connected very much with that idea. And, um, you know, I also love what you just said, like, 
you're not a 20 year old. And you're just like, I just want to get better at BJJ and insert any art in there. I just yeah. want to spend my next five years getting better at art X. Like, I just think that's awesome. You know, it's, um, it is something we get to do for life. I always tell my students, I say this, this is for life. You're not bound to it for life, but it's for your life. Like you get to have this for your life. And I, and I really heard shades of that in our conversation tonight. And I really appreciated our time. What do you want to go out on tonight, Sensei? Well, I want to thank every one of you in this opportunity to come on this and um, thank Leo Laux. I think we got induced through, introduced through Leo, um, who I have the utmost respect for him as a person, as a martial artist, uh, as a fighter. Even when I run into different times, I don't say hello, Leo. I say, hey, champ, how are you doing today, right? It's always going to be that that guy. I was there when he fought and uh, pitched a shutout when he won that title. He just won every single ounce of one of the best fights you could ever watch. Um, so I really thank all of you and the opportunity to come on here and, and discuss some things and share some things. So in closing, I would probably, you know, I, I'm really... Uh, I like to remember and, and recognize the people that I've been influenced by, whether it was in the early days through Ralph and so on, or whether, you know, I got a chance to train with Benny Urquidez and Bill Wallace and Joe Lewis, and uh, I've done Gracie seminars and so on. And it's like, you just look at these people and you go, wow, there's just so much to learn. And I just get excited about doing better. And I think I was talking to you guys earlier about that quote, I'll put my, my, my cheaters on for this. Um, <laughs> I believe it's from Isaac Newton. If I have seen further or farther, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Well, I'm still standing and I'm still looking to see further. And I'm just so thankful to people that have been able to influence my life to help me develop as a martial artist, appreciate the cultures, appreciate the arts, all the arts and all the people that are involved and what the value they have and what they offer to people and the training and, and so on. And um, be able to pass it on to train other people to see them get excited about it like you said don't let them forget lose santa claus just keep training get excited about you know show me that next little show me that next move that i can pull off or mm. trying to make better and you know what i mean so thank you very much thanks sensei um sensei dofan you want to tell us all what's coming up this month we got a nice full month well Next Thursday, we got uh, Jamie Seabrook. Um, he's in London. And you'll, you'll like Sean, you and I have this in Cincinnati. He's, he's a professor at Western, actually at Brusher College. Eighth Ed in Kempo, does BJJ, um, modern Arnese. So good quality martial artist. Looking forward to talking to him. And then Chris Hansen, who is a person, again, who he came walking in the dojo here one day with uh, another person I know, and we just started talking. He has a good podcast. He's trained with a lot of the same. He's a short and root karate practitioner, trained with a lot of the same people that uh, our history goes back to, people like Kwai Wong. So it'll be mm -hmm. fun to talk to him. And yeah, that's what we got going on. We're also releasing more shorts and micro episodes, and those things are always great and fun. That's awesome. So yeah, I will throw everybody back to our website, punchkickchokechat.com, because you can check out, you know, we, we do have that listed for the third week in February, um, where you can go check out that micro short we're releasing. And that's where you can see all those episodes. You can access the shorts, the micros, the, the online stuff. We're, we're super stoked about it. And we're super stoked to have you on board. And I just want to give my thanks to Justin Shea, to Robert Schlumsky, who may be a dad times three as of now, or four, you never know, to Andre Sadashev, to Alden Adair, to Jesse Vlevitao, and Daniel J. Holland III for all their help uh, running things behind the scenes. There's no show without them. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you, Senseis, for hosting this with me each week. It's such an honor. And Sensei Bonner, thank you again. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night.